Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wayne Jurek II. Uh, Wayne got his PhD at the University of Florida, Florida studying sclerotinia. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Uh, it's known as white mold. It's one of the most common pathogens for agricultural crops. It infects over 400 crops. Uh, many of them have a lot of monetary values, such as soybeans, um, canola, and what, what else was it? Uh, um, uh, sunflower. And sunflower. Uh, after finishing his degree at the University of Florida, Wayne went to uh, the USDA in Beltsville, Maryland. I don't know if you guys know about this facility, but it's a hub for research, for agricultural research. There's over 1,000 researchers, and a lot of famous uh, discoveries have been made there, including some that might interest plant people here, phytochrome, um, and 2,4-D, uh, the 2,4-D herbicide. And I got to know Wayne really well. He was my uh, PI when I was at Beltsville, and, and um, we worked on penicillium and other post-harvest uh, diseases. Thanks, All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the introduction. All right. So how many people are online? Okay. All right. So if I stand here, they can see me? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I really I've enjoyed uh, my time here so far. Um, and, and I want to tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm going to repeat my title here. So it's an intriguing tale of a non-host specific mycotoxin, plant cell death, ecological impacts, active efflux, and leveraging culture collections for plant fungal microbe interactions. That's a mouthful. Uh, I, as Michael said, I am the lead scientist uh, and research plant pathologist at Beltsville Agriculture Research Center in Beltsville, Maryland, 600 acre uh, campus where we do plant and animal research. Uh, located in the middle of downtown Beltsville. So uh, I want to just sort of give you an idea where we're going today on our, uh, with an outline here. And I think you're going to get a lot of uh, bang for your buck here. So there's some introductory material to try to introduce you to uh, fungal toxins, some penicillium biology. And then I'll go into um, patulin uh, host microbiology. So one of our latest stories that we published in phytopathology uh, that talks about this subject. Then I'll move into... Uh, something that's sort of related is it's leveraging culture collections for uh, studying plant pathogens. And so I think this is an underutilized um, uh, asset, asset that, that people can think of a little bit more. And I want to show you how we've integrated this into our research program. And then finally, I'm going to try to summarize all the findings. And uh, again, my, my, my idea today is that we have fun, but also that you learn something. You leave here with your fingers in your ears so the information doesn't flow out, okay? And then if you have any questions while we go along, you can stop me if I'm not clear. I do talk kind of fast. Uh, so anyway, this is Beltsville. If you haven't been there, how many people have been to Beltsville campus? No, oh, you, duh, you have. All right, so uh, this is it. This is the view from US-1. This is like the most famous building because the administrators sit right here in the, in the place with the cupola on it, okay, the bell tower. I worked in this building here. Michael and I worked here. So the buildings are one through five, and we're undergoing renovations right now. So I actually moved into a, a building where phytochrome and 2,4-D was discovered and all these famous discoveries um, that hopefully will rub off on, on some other things. So to get you get your head in the ball game as far as mycotoxins, I don't know how much people know about them. Um, I didn't certainly, I was trained in what they do, but I've been thinking a lot more about them in the context of our current research. So I thought there were kind of four questions that sort of come to mind when you talk about fungal toxins. So first of all, what are they? Second of all, which fungi produce them? Third, how do they work? So I'm, I'm pretty mechanistic. Uh, I always want to know why or how things are, are working. And then finally, what are their biological roles? And so this is just to intend to give you a quick summary of kind of what mycotoxins are. And it by no means does justice to the topic, okay? I'm just trying to get you uh, some, some fundamental um, information so we're all on the same page. So starting with the first question, what are mycotoxins? Well, in general, they're chemically complex compounds, and they're generally built from polyketides, which are snapped together with acetate, okay? And this is a relatively uh, common 
uh, uh, fungal toxin here produced by Cercospora species. This is Cercosporin, the perloquinone uh, toxin. Again, uh, it, it is a ke very chemically complex. Um, and, and toxins in general, mycotoxins are divided into two general areas, host specifics. Anybody remember the uh, Southern corn leaf blight epidemic from 1970? So this toxin is what's important for that. Okay, it's a host-specific toxin. goes after one of the goes after uh, the, the corn plant, and so this is a, 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 an example of a host-specific. But then there's non-host-specific, which is just like the name implies. It just they just sort of kill everything, and so um, you have these two very diverse categories here. And then lastly, um, these toxins generally, again, I'm generalizing here, but in the case of cercosporin, are produced by these secondary metabolic gene clusters. So fungi um, ha have these clusters that are organized in a pretty interesting way. And this is the CTB cluster. This is from our PNAS paper in 2018 with Melvin and uh, Ronnie and a lot of other uh, collaborators. But this CTB cluster contains everything that's needed to produce that weirdo looking organic molecule I just showed you. And so what you'll see here is some polyketide synthases, methyltransferases, there's some transporters in here, uh, lacase. So they're all the genes encoding enzymes that are need to put that molecule together are here. And, and you'll see that these this is very characteristic where these secondary metabolic uh, gene clusters have the ORFs going in both five to three prime orientation and also in three to five prime orientation. So this is a Cercospora baticula gene cluster. Um, so uh, kind of giving you an idea, what are they? So what fungi produce them? Do all fungi produce them? Well, some, some, some simple examples here, macro fungi, right? People trip out on mushrooms. So here's psilocybe. Um, this is what, um, this is sort of what the people call the magic mushroom, um, plant, human, and animal pathogens produce mycotoxins. Okay. So something like this, uh, sugar beet leaf that's loaded with Cercospora baticula, um, and a CLS spot here. So all these different uh, yellowing and this necrotic areas is in part due to that photoactivated toxin I just showed you. And then saprophytes and endophytes. So these mycotoxin production is relatively widely conserved in kingdom fungi. And then the example for an endophyte that I'm sure everyone is pretty familiar with here happened to be Epichloe. And this is a grass endophyte here uh, growing that produces you know, all those ergot or excuse me, um, these those uh, lonely and alkaloids and all those other different weird compounds uh, that are important for those interactions. So uh, that sort of powers us through those two first questions. And so then the question becomes, well, how do they work? Well, just like everything in biology from very small scale all the way up to the macro scale, it depends on the chemical structure in the biological context. So, um, but in general, they, they do lots of different things. Um, we're going to talk about interfering with redox today, but they inhibit protein synthesis, they induce cell cycle arrest, they inhibit topoisomerase, they're pretty nasty things, okay? So their mechanism and their way that they work is pretty pretty broad, and their biological impacts, right? So you've heard of uh, Don toxin, right? That's the vo or vomitoxin. Some of these long-term cause liver cancer, uh, blind staggers in horses, uh, hallucinations, if you like magic mushrooms. So you have a whole bunch of different physiological acute and long-term uh, effects of these mycotoxins. And then lastly, what roles do they serve? So I started asking my, myself the question, well, there's got to be more to it than just making people and plants sick. And so uh, what, 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 I've, what we've found or what, what's been shown in the literature is that these toxins generally are there to help kill the host tissue and enhance the symptoms. So if you, have a, if you have a fungus that no longer produces a toxin, it used to produce a toxin, a lot of times it'll still infect, but it just doesn't do as good of a job, okay? So they're considered virulence factors in most cases, and they inhibit the growth of competitors. So, you know, you have other things that are going on, you know, in, in let's say an immunocompromised lung or on the surface of an apple fruit, which is what I think about a lot. Um, so these toxins inhibit the growth of other, other competitors so they, they can modify their niche, you know, put out a poison that only they can deal with and kill everybody else around so they get to eat at the buffet table. They can serve as signaling molecules, all right? So this, this here is a, a scanning, cryo-scanning EM micrograph that my friend and I took at Beltsville. He's no longer with us. 
And uh, the unit is, is still around, but uh, took a really nice picture of the penicillium expansum this happens to be. Um, so that's just sometimes these pictures here mean something. Sometimes they don't. They're just there because I was told my slides are too boring. So I need pictures up here. Okay, you can guess who told me that. All right, anyway. All right, so um, shifting gears. So the joke is, you know, this is uh, penicillium canidia 4 here on the, on the gear shift. Uh, shifting gears into the penicillium world here. Um, thinking about what what's what are some issues with stored fruit? Okay, so this is my ballywick. I work on stored rots, uh, rots of stored uh, agricultural products, mostly palm fruits like apple. Okay, so if you've ever been to an apple packing house, and you probably haven't, maybe you have. They're kind of boring. The the sorting stuff is really cool, but this is how they're stored, right? So they're just poured all into this big giant crate, and they're stored in the dark. They got their their stems there. And they bump into each other. They make these little holes in the fruit. Um, cons consumers want fruit that have intact stems. Okay. And they, no wonder these, we have problems with rot. Okay. So, you know, they're not, they're not put in nice little safe little things. They're, they're just thrown in here. So this is kind of where things start, start to go with this project that I'm working on with penicillin that causes blue mold of apples. So in general fruit, and the apples that you eat commercially are stored at one to four degrees C, depending on variety, and for up to six months, which is quite a long time. However, you can really get some life out of the fruit if you use controlled atmosphere, which a lot of these commercial growers use. And the difference between the two is, is that you just simply alter the oxygen and the CO2 concentration in the room, and you can get really nice fruit up to 12 months, believe it or not. So when you're eating apples in, let's say, July or August, you're eating last year's harvest. Okay, you're not eating fruit from right now unless you grew them yourself. But um, so that I always it was intriguing. And in the storage to help facilitate this process is a ripening inhibitor that I'm sure a lot of people know about. It's MCP, post harvest fungicides, they fog into these rooms, and this DPA to, for scald, which is another thing. So they do a lot of treatments in these giant storage rooms. So this is kind of gives you a background of uh, what's going on with the rot situation. So blue mold is one of the most predominant fungi that causes rot. Um, and it's, it, excuse me, blue mold is a disease caused by penicillin expansum. It's a global problem for, for stored fruit. Uh, losses are due to rot and patulin contamination, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Patulin is a mycotoxin produced by this fungus. And lastly, for uh, just general information, Post-harvest fungicides are usually used for control. So the growers don't have a lot of uh, options when it comes to abating rot, okay? Besides getting rid of the rot, culling, and uh, there are no commercial uh, cultivars with resistance, at, which is one of the things we're working on um, to figure out how we can engineer some resistance so they have some other tools besides chemicals. And so this is what the, the, the problem looks like. This is a really advanced lesion. Um, I mean, you can see the entire fruit is just covered uh, with these blue-green colored canidia, these caremia, uh, canidial tufts, if you will. And, you know, this is basically a nice, mushy, wet mess, all right? So you pick this thing up, and it's really wet and soggy. has a real earthy smell to it. Um, I smell a lot of these things, probably shouldn't, um, but that's one of the volatiles that's coming off of there. It gives that an earthy smell. So this is what it looks like. This is... This is actually one of the bigger commercial growers, um, packers in the East Coast. So if, you get a, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a cryo SEM on hand, which we, we do at Beltsville, uh, Gary Bouchon and I took these photos together. This is a penicillium expansum, uh, world canidia for, sort of the witch's broom with these canidia that are born in chains terminally. All right, these are the primary source of inoculum. Um, so you, you can see this here. And then if you take a closer look at the uh, spores, you see they almost look like sort of beads on a string, um, sort of the, they kind of get twisted almost, they look like. And we were lucky enough to catch this um, even closer up where some of the uh, connection here was, was broken from the next one. So I thought that was a really nice uh, high, high, uh, image, high quality image that we took together. Um, a little bit more about penicillin biology requires a wound for ingress. It's kind of a wimp. It needs, a, it needs a wound. It can go through some natural openings, but it doesn't direct infect, okay? Uh, it alters the host, t host tissue pH by acidification. It's a strict necrotroph, dumps tons of uh, carbohydrate, active enzymes, and organic acids to facilitate decay. 
you can see this here. Um, the, again, this is a little bit less. Uh, these are these are manually inoculated, so I'm cheating here. The other one was a naturally occurring. <laughs> these are manually inoculated in a lab, and they show you um, the nice distinct distinct circular lesions here. Again, no host. I already told you this. No host resistance in apple cultivars. Heat stable polyketide in, implicated in penicillin expansion virulence looks like this. Guess what this is? Is patulin. Okay, that's a toxin I would mention earlier. <clears throat> it contaminates a pro uh, contaminates processed apple products. So why do you why do we care about it besides the fact that it's interesting biology? Well, it's a potential uh, carcinogen, and the EU and the FDA have very strict strict limits on this um, particular molecule, and it has uh, limits of 50 micrograms per kilogram for all products in the FDA. The European Union is a little bit more strict for uh, children and infants. They drop it in half uh, for children, and then it goes down to 10, I think, PPB um, or micrograms per kilogram uh, of, of this particular compound. It has some interesting chemistry if you you read the literature. Um, it's a Michael acceptor. It, it undergoes some Michael electrophilic um, uh, reactions that open this ring up. When you open the ring, you destroy the function. It can also undergo some hydrolysis in uh, aqueous. But after saying all of that, it's still really stable. You find it in pasteurized products. Uh, um, uh, fermentation doesn't get rid of this all the way. Okay, so this is a big problem for industry, and they're 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 concerned about this. So one thing I want to show you, so the, the first example I showed you of the secondary metabolic cl uh, cluster, right? That, that's a little bit linear and boring, all right? This puts it more into context. This is how patulin's made, right? So this is the molecule I just showed you in the ball and stick figure, the previous, the previous figure. It starts out as uh, acetate here and goes through a series of reactions, and there's 12 of them. And this group down here in China, Lee, uh, basically knocked out every single gene in this pathway, which was really cool. And they tagged all of these things. And so they know in the cell where they're going. And they still don't know what some of this stuff's doing, as you'll see by these question marks here. But I want you to pay attention to this part here. See this? All of these things are encoded by the cluster. If you look here, there's two pumps in that cluster. Now, I can tell you in the penicillium genome, there's, there's, there's a, a, probably 150 different pumps. OK, so but we know that this PAT C and M are localized to the uh, to the membrane and we they hypothesize that it pumps this intermediate out, which is non toxic. And this enzyme, which we also showed is secreted, actually converts this compound to patulin. And this is part of the thing that we think is allowing the fungus to deal with its own toxin. So this thing, it basically makes the toxin to a certain point, and then it dumps it out and converts it to its final toxic property, which is pretty ingenious, I think. Um, I don't think this is the entire story. I think this is part of it, but I think there's other things going on besides that, but this gives us a good foothold. So this came out in 2019. My stuff came out in 2020 with a completely different way that showed that this is indeed uh, a secreted protein, and then it's misregulated in one of our mutants. So we we sort of indirectly verified their data. Now, I don't have any of the data on exactly where this molecule is going. I'm trying to work with some chemists to fluorescently label this thing, and apparently it's not that easy to do, all right? But that's one of the things we want to look at is finding out where it's going and how it's, and figuring out if it's binding to something, is it getting is it getting degraded? And so these are questions for further investigation, but I just want you to remember this part here. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears again to the real story here. So again, back to my gear shift lever with the patulin molecule on here. So three areas of investigation in my lab center around fungal virulence in the penicillium uh, context, toxin biology and antimicrobial resistance. And I think this story that I'm gonna tell you today that's the heart of this sort of hits all three of these themes, which um, we didn't set out to do on purpose. It just kind of happened in the process of science. Um, so what's known about patulin and what, what does it do? Well, it's an old, it's been around, it's, it's knowledge of its existence has been around since 1943. It was discovered by Dr. Nancy Atkinson in 1943, who was a bacteriologist. It was originally discovered as a, um, as a bacteria side, okay? So an antimicrobial, 
It's produced by penicillium species and aspergillus. There's some polyseomyces that produce it as well. Um, some other uh, less common fungi that infect fruit. It is a virulence factor in apple fruit interaction. So if you make a mutant in that last step I showed you, Pat E, you delete that. You don't accumulate patulin. The, the, the fungus can still infect, but it just doesn't do its job as well. Okay. So it is, a, it is a virulence factor. We know this. So these are the things that are known. So when I started this, I was like, okay, well, what don't we know? Well, can patulin alone, if you can get it purified, you, can you add it to the, the fruit and mimic some of the symptoms? I mean, that's a pretty simple experiment to do. Is the effect host-specific? And if it is, is it dose-dependent? Um, can patulin affect other fungal pathogens? So this was something I think we took a step further trying to understand Okay, there's other fungi besides penicillium hanging out on the apple fruit and those crates, remember I showed you? Is it doing something to them? And then how do fungi resist their own toxin? And I think we get at part of the reason that they're able to do this. And it's all centered, part of it's centered around that export of that intermediate. So the first experiment we did is we got our hands on purified patulin toxin from Sigma Chemical, thank you very much. And we added it to apple fruit. So what I want to tell you quickly here is, is we took 80% methanol, which is toxic to fungi. So we had to switch over to a different solvent. But we have a, a solvent only control here after 24 hours and seven days. You see absolutely no issues at all, except for the wound that we have to create. And we use a physiologically relevant amount of, to of toxin, which is quite a bit, so 138 micrograms in the wound. And I'll tell you from a total production um, standpoint, this is how much this, this fungus that I have is a model R19 produces in the uh, culture after, after seven days. That's how much it produces. Um, as far as it being in range to what other, other penicillin produce, it's right in the middle. So you can pretty much go tenfold up and down and that's your range reported in the literature. It's pretty wide. So I felt good about this. This was our top concentration. So it's physiologically relevant. There's no argument there. What's interesting is, is here's the, here's the patulin treated uh, app fruit. By 24 hours, you start to see some, uh, some, some necrosis, some tissue collapse. And then by three days, you max out and you see this nice radial um, boom, browning tissue collapse. It's not watery, but um, it, it definitely mirrors what you would see um, in the, uh, if, if, you had a, if you had the fungus there which was really cool. So that's sort of our first question is you know, the toxin is partially responsible for some of these symptoms we're seeing, at least early on. And this again was, was work was done by um, my postdoc, Holly Bartholomew. We published this in uh, 2022. Next question is, is the uh, effect dose dependent? So if you titrate the dose down tenfold and you look at uh, mean lesion diameter in the fruit, which is depicted here, you can see that um, this, this, this necrosis or radial, radial uh, tissue death that extends out from the wound um, sort of undetectable after you get down to about right here. Okay, here's our methanol carrier. That was a pretty simple experiment to do. One cultivar though. So that's a, another question, all right? So that's coming up next. So here we got the cultivar with just one cultivar, Golden Delicious, I think. It looks really green though, so. Then we ask, okay, well, what about other fruit? So um, I didn't tell you this, but penicillium infects um, pears. So we did the same experiment we did before, wait seven days, add either methanol or 138 micrograms of uh, patulin dissolved in methanol. You add it to apple as a control. She's got the quantitative lesion size here. Um, you'll see the, the, the cell death again, same phenotype, same thing with pear. That wasn't much of a stretch, but look at this. <clears throat> If you take a penicillin expansum, any of them, and stick them on citrus, you don't get infection, okay? It's just not, it's not suited for that. It's a different species that infects. But look at the toxin. You get a nice cell death phenotype that's going on around here, tissue collapse. So this thing is non-host specific. It infects all types of different fruits. And I'll show you slides later on. It also infects the model plant Arabidopsis, which is also part of our plan to try to start using genetically defined Arabidopsis to try to understand how this is working. So keep that in mind too. 
this is rather boring, but you have to do it for reviewers. So we, we, we you know, I told you it's one, one cultivar I looked at. Well, what about other cultivars? Because you, you guys know, you're, you, how many people are eating Golden Delicious? Maybe some people are. I don't know. But, I mean, Fuji, right? That's pretty popular. Gala, Goldens, Grannies for pies. Honeycrisp and ugh, the Red Delicious way down here. We use a simple test where we cut the fruit in half and we spray with I2KI. And it just gives us an idea of how much starch is in the fruit. So simple crash course in fruit physiology 101. <clears throat> the fruit start off a zero is they're all black. They stain starch very heavily. An eight is there's no starch left. <laughs> we acquired these fruit at the end of the season. <laughs> and you can see the mean starch cores are pretty relatively similar. So these fruit are very mature, which was good because we wanted them to be relatively similar for our next test. And I just say we assess them using a starch iodine. That's pretty simple stuff. So a asking the question, do the fruit, do different apple cultivars respond differently to patulin at the maximum concentration after seven days? You do the same experiment. Boom, you use, you know, and you'll see here mean lesion diameter. You know, you run anywhere from uh, what is that around 11 all, all the way up to 14 ish. Um, but you can see the pictures of the fruit here. Um, so the answer is it affects all these cultivars, right? That it kind of could predict that without doing it, but you have to do it. And there's some some subtle variation between these varieties, but for the most part, they're all sub, they're all sensitive. Okay, now I just told you about effects on the host, but what happens to itself? <laughs> how is the fungus? How could the fungus? So I like to torture fungi in the lab. So I'm like, oh, what if I trade? What if I take patulin and I add it to the to the fungal cultures. And then I do a canidial germination test. And I just do a simple thing where I look 13 hours after they've been germinating on PDA and I count germ germinated spores. <clears throat> so that's exactly what we did. We have six different um, isolates. This one is not an expansum. This is a crustosum isolate. And you can see after 13 hours, our water controls, because remember I told you Fungi can't handle methanol, at least at that concentration. So I have to switch back to water as a carrier. So this tells you everything's behaving here. But look at the differences in, in, in sensitivity um, and germination rates. Look at this. Bar barely germinating. This guy is totally paralyzed. This one's drinking it for breakfast. And then you have some intermediates here. If you look at this 24 hours later, you start to see <coughs> you start to see some differences. But again, they're maintained. Um, they just keep growing. Okay, so after 24 hours, germination process is already going. The main effect is already taken, is, is effect, the main effect is observed here, but also here. And these other areas, these other phenotypes become um, evident. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have moderately resistant, what I call, these are all artificial categories, right? You could say anything. But resistant, these guys are almost up to the, where the water controls are. And then you've got ones that are very sensitive. And this, this uh, non-expansive non species still not germinating, still hanging out. So if you look at this, patulin impact observes, is observed early in the canidial germination process. And I'll show you what that looks like. So if you take one that's very resistant, like you saw on the previous slide, Look, you're counting germinated spores here. Boom, 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 boom. This is after 13 hours. This is the water control, so you can't count anything. That's a TMTC, too many to count, okay? But then look at this P11, which is uh, an expansive species. It's just sitting there, okay? Doesn't like it. It's very unhappy, all right? So we know, we know that patulin, if you add it exogenously to the fungus, spores it's messing up its germination it's out of context but it's messing up its germination so i told holly i said well let's let those plates go let's let them sit for let's just let them sit for a week and come back and look at them so what's really interesting here is is look at this look at the water controls here all right now look at the patulin treated regardless of their of their original reaction to uh to the toxin they all form colonies that look no different than the controls morphologically size wise everything so they grow out of this so the impact is early on in the process 
which I thought was relatively interesting. And from a biological perspective, it also kind of makes sense because a lot of these strains, they don't start producing or you can't pick up toxin until about three days after the infection. So we are taking it out of context, but there's something, something interesting going on here. So I just said that regardless of the resistance phenotype, uh, you get growth of, you get growth. All right. Now what happens to other fungi? So, you know, um, there's alternaria, there's botrytis, there's calitotricum, there's monolinea, there's all these apple rot fungi out there. And we wanted to ask the question with our canidial germination assay, again, with our water control and our patulin <clears throat> addition, what happens to uh, canidial germination after 24 hours in these different species? Well, the water controls look really good after 24 hours, or almost up to 100%. Look at alternaria and botrytis. And they can kind of hang out a little bit. They grow, they, they germinate and stop. And we get absolutely no growth or no germination with Calitotricum fiorini and monolinea ferticula. Okay, so patulin inhibits the germination of these, of these uh, non-penicillin species and elongation as well, okay? So if you let them grow out for seven days, here's what you get. Water-treated cultures. This is what you'd expect. Nice, healthy-looking mycelial mat. Patulin-treated, nothing. Very different. They can't recover. Question is why? Well, we don't know why specifically, but we went back to our penicillium test with canidia, and we take water as represented by this bar and dimethyl sulfoxide for our carrier that I'm going to explain here in a minute, and then also a chlorgolin. And we use three different concentrations of this. Does anybody know what chlorgolin is? <clears throat> it's an old school uh, MAOI inhibitor that shuts down um, efflux pumps. So remember back to the diagram with the, what I told you, the intermediate being pumped out. So I hypothesized that Perhaps if we inhibit that process, we might be able to make the, some of the most resistant strains sensitive to their own toxin again. So here I wanted to make sure that there's no effect of the, of the, the chlorgolin alone or the carrier. And you see everything's behaving here. But if you add, um, if you take one of the most resistant isolates and you add chlorgolin, you start to see a little bit of a drop and a little bit more and a little bit more. This is at 250 micromolar, which is quite high concentration. It's only 50%, but you can still make the most resistant isolate sensitive to its own toxin. So this is part of what I think is going on mechanistically, but it's not the whole story. And I didn't show you this because there's a lot of information and I'm talking a lot, but if you take a moderately resistant or a sensitive, it's the same trend. You just make something weak, even weaker, okay? You can, if you're real interested, you can go look uh, at the paper. So chlorgolin inhibits active efflux in a dose-dependent manner, and it sensitizes uh, ex penicillin expansive strains to its own treatment. So that was all put into one huge paper that we put into uh, phytopathology. And again, I told you, I'm interested in virulence. I'm interested in toxin biology. And so I want to show you a little bit about how we brought in some culture collections, um, one from Westerdyke into this into a study here all right so again the, the the funny part is the culture collection on the shift knob here of a fungus growing all right so culture collections are fantastic resources uh, aka biological reference libraries so from a, a plant pathologist or a fungal biology perspective um, you can think of you know any anywhere that has fungal collections even plant collections whatever whatever collection you're talking about we're talking about cultural collections today excuse me they can largely be viewed as untapped treasure, untapped treasure trove of strange genes and secondary metabolic gene clusters and natural products. And the way I want to show you uh, how this is related is the blue mold um, virulence model. So comparing levels of decay in different species. So we do know this, I'm sort of cheating and going ahead, but some species cause a lot more decay than others. Expansum tends to be a very aggressive uh, pathogen. So we want to kind of understand why that could, why that is. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I don't know if it's a good sign or a bad sign, but uh, we found two penicillin species isolates with greatly reduced virulence in apple fruit. So they dropped in basically from the air conditioning system, got cultured on hygromycin resistant plates. Total 
total accident, okay? <laughs> and we sequence them using whole genome sequencing. Michael helped us out with some L L multi locus sequencing, typing, and phylogeny. And we revealed that these two strains we're interested in, um, they looked like chrysogenum, but they, 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 uh, they are chrysogenum with these type specimens here. Um, you can see they're most closely related to them. Um, the sister, uh, they just split these, Rubens and Chrysogenum. So we put some of those in there as well to make sure that they aren't uh, Rubens. They're more close, way more closely related to Chrysogenum. Again, again this is a figure that we're going to put together for our, our, our upcoming paper. But the biology behind this is even, I think, more intriguing. So if you see R19 here, these are apple fruit inoculated with spores um, from R19, which is penicillin expansum. You get the characteristic rot. Look at this. Here's 404, 413, water control, nothing. Cut them open. Look in here. We can isolate back from this. They're sitting in there. They're just not, they're not causing any problems. So when I saw this, I'm like, wow, this, this could be a really cool system to compare between species to understand how the blue mold fungus causes rot from a genetic standpoint, chemical standpoint, whatever you want to look at. And one of the first things you do is you, you ask the question, well, how do these things grow in culture compared to R19? Remember, this is the apple rot guy that produces toxin. These guys grow very well. Oftentimes, you get a mutant here, um, a single gene mutant that's well-defined, and, and they don't grow very well in culture. And then, you know, they're not going to grow well in fruit either, right? So that's not the case here. Our, our 404 and 413 strains are growing exceedingly well. And by the way, they germinate at the same rate, if not better than R19. So it's not because of some gross simplistic defect here in the biology. So um, the question now becomes, are these things really that special? Okay, because they came in from, I, I'm hypothesizing an air vent or something, landing on my hygromycin plates, I subculture them. And I'm talking to these guys from um, the Netherlands Dr. Hobroken and Disterhus, am I saying that right? You know them, right? Uh, Jan and Joost from Westerdijk in the Netherlands. And they say, well, why don't you take some of our type strains from their collection and test them and see if they can infect and if they're, you know, hygromycin resistant. So <laughs> they sent us the strains. Um, we ended up getting them around Christmas. Um, which was a nice Christmas present. We got four type specimens of Chrysogenum, the three from Rubens. And we did a simple experiment where we plated these on hygromycin. We also uh, tested their virulence in Apple to see if they were also, also able to launch decay or not, de not launch decay. And the simple answer is, I'm spoiling it, is yes. Okay, I'm not showing you the hygromycin data, but um, the in vitro data here, or vivo data from the Apple uh, inoculations, Three different cultivars. Um, this is golden. Uh, that is uh, Fuji. That is Honeycrisp. Um, and you'll see the, the nice characteristic lesion here after seven days. Here are these type specimens from Chrysogenum and even Rubens here. And you see absolutely nothing. You cut these fruit open, nothing happens. So they look just like our 404 and 413. So that's just basic. That tells us some interesting things. But it's a gateway into understanding this at multiple levels. And um, um, we're working with a, a, a scientist in our lab now using some LCMS to try to look at small molecule production differences between the two. We've got the genome sequenced. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But my point here is here, here's, some, here's some type culture collection strains that can be used for very interesting things to understand fundamental questions in science but also to understand, um, we also want to try to see if these things will antagonize our, our apple rot fungus. So how did I, we don't know how, how do they play together? Like if you put chrysogenum and, and, and expand them together, maybe somebody's already done this. Do they, do they get, do they not, ha are they not happy? Can we use them in some way to formulate some type of uh, same genus uh, competition uh, coding for bins or something? I don't know, but in summary, um, I want to go back to the original questions from the beginning of the talk, because I, I went over a lot of stuff, and I want to I want to just sort of uh, come full circle here. So the question was, can patulin application mimic blue mold symptoms? And the simple answer is, yes. And I hope I think I hope I have convinced you that um, is the toxin host specific, 
and dose dependent? And the answers are no and yes. Um, does patchulin impact other fungal phytopathogens? It does in vitro. Uh, we haven't done the in vivo experiments to, to explore this. And then, and then the other thing that I think is even most, so, so the big takeaway here is how do penicillin species tolerate their own toxin? And I think in part, it's due to efflux pump activity from the drug studies we did. But it's not the whole story. And I think there's more to it than that. Um, and as, you, as we also demonstrated, patulin impacts early, early canidial germination, germ tube elongation events. Um, and, and that kind of makes sense on how patulin works, which I didn't tell you. Uh, it, it messes with the redox balance. And when you're putting cell wall components together, you, you generate a lot of reactive species and you got to deal with this uh, oxidative environment. If you throw that off, I think the fungus just can't put those modules together as well. This is just a hypothesis. And so that, that would be why you'd see the early, er, early uh, events in, in canidial germ tube elongation. Uh, there's a range of sensitivity that exists between penicillin species isolates to exogenous patulin application, and they use efflux in part. Uh, patulin is produced by penicillin species to aid pathogen ingress and to exclude other fungi of the infection core. That's one of our hypotheses is that, you know, the fungus does all this work to get in there and start breaking everything down and making carbohydrates. And it doesn't want someone else to come over and hijack it and be like, hey, man, can I eat some of your carbon? No, you can't. Well, you can if you can deal with their toxin, right? So this is kind of our working hypothesis as to why this, why this fungus produces this molecule, not just to make us sick and not just to kill the apple cells, but it does a lot of different things. And that's, I think, pretty exciting. Uh, strains 4 and 4, 413 are clearly penicillium chrysogenum. Michael helped nail us down with the MLST, uh, the nice tree that he built us along with the genome sequence data we have. Uh, the type strains mirror the phenotypes and apple fruit for we found. And then these specimens, we're gonna, as I alluded to earlier, could be used for antagonism studies and comparative omics to study fungal virulence strategies. And that's kind of one of the things I like to do is use a systems approach to try to understand how these things are launching uh, decay. And I, I kind of hope I illustrated that culture collections are great sources of strains for a variety of applications, antagonists, small molecule discovery, unknown genes, all kinds of things. You just have to look. And I think they can really be at the heart of discovery on the fungal side. That's my bias, but also could be plant side. It could be herbarium specimens, um, you know, natural product discovery. It could be anything. It's only limited by your imagination. So then the next question is, and I'm, I'm almost done, and man, I'm, 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 all, I'm on time too. <laughs> what, so what's next, okay? So uh, if they don't redirect me and I get, I get to do what I want to do, uh, I want to try to figure out how patch, determine the patchland mode of action in penicillium expansum, how it's killing non-penicillium species, and then how it's working in planta. And how do I want to do this is I want to, I want to kind of uh, put my eggs in sort of a couple different baskets here. One, I want to take a non-targeted approach. Um, I have a tDNA mutant, um, random tDNA mutant uh, library of about 500 isolates, 500 transformants of penicillin expansum. And then I also want to acquire Arabidopsis, uh, the, the tDNA mutant library from Arabidopsis. And I want, to, I want to apply patulin and I want to screen them for ones that are hypersensitive and ones that are resistant. And then I want to go in and do some genetics, some sequencing to figure out why that is. And I could use the omics approach, comparative transcriptomics, metabolomics now with Brett Cooper with his LCMSMS we have. Um, then, then also maybe a more target approach is warranted as well. Because I, I, I didn't really go into what's known about patchel and how it works in human cells. I didn't think that might be as interesting for you guys. But again, it, it perturbs redox balance. So I was thinking maybe look at um, a targeted approach with drugs that perturb conserved signaling pathways, mediating redox, program cell death, and autophagy. So I kind of have a, a hunch that there's something going on with that toxin, and it, it may be kicking off some, some form of program cell death or autophagy. And there's lots of drugs, man. You can get these catalogs online of these things that will do, do activate or, or inhibit certain processes. And you can just treat your fungus with it. It's a really, it's a pretty elegant thing. Um, if it works, it tells you something. If it doesn't work, it tells you nothing. So it's kind of a quick, easy experiment to do. Also, Arabidopsis mutants 
okay? In these same pathways, they have them. Treat them with patulin assessed phenotypes, okay? And then verify this stuff because we can in the lab um, if we want to look at botrytis for sensitivity or if we want to look at uh, penicillium for resistance factors. We can always make knockouts in the genes that we find that are up or down regulated or important in these pathways and show some proof of concept. So uh, before I end, I just want to show you um, a rabbitopsis. This is coal ecotype. This when we work on plants, you can see a little bit of some, some, some unhappiness here with the methanol only for these leaves. But if you look at this, it's, doesn't this look hauntingly familiar? These are the exact same concentrations I tested in apple fruit. And this is so cool because these leaves were just treated with a 10 microliter droplet of the solution containing the low 0 0.0138 micrograms of, talk of patulin all the way up to the 13.8. Look at this, man. It really knocks a, knocks a nice hole there. So you have this dose-dependent response in 24 hours on a model system that can really start to, I think, move us forward is how is this working in planta? If you look at it real close, the lowest concentration, you get some, again, necrosis, some cell death, but even in the higher constant, the highest concentration in, in contrast, you have some necrosis here, but also yellowing that's spreading out around that spot. And you don't need to wound these. When we did it, we did wounding versus not, but you don't need to wound them with a rabbitopsis. It just goes right in. So to end my presentation, I just want to acknowledge the people who did the work. Um, Holly, Dr. Holly Bartholomew, pictured here, is the ORISE postdoctoral scholar. Uh, Bergenetta Gaskins is my support scientist. We've been working together since I've been there at Beltsville. Otelia Macarissan was my um, summer student help. She's now, um, where is she? She is now, I think, um, at one of the federal departments. She's a math major. Did a fantastic job in the lab, uh, just really liked biology, but uh, comes from a math background. Uh, and the funding. So where's the money come from? USDA ARS National Program 303 Plant Diseases. So you, if you know anything about USDA ARS, we're intramurally funded. That means we have a, a small, steady source of money every year to be able to do this stuff, which kind of helps. But then we also fish for money, and I've gotten some money from NIFA, CPPM, and the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission to support some of this. So you can sort of support your base money on competitive funds and keep the lights on and keep hiring people and keep moving things. So sort of a hybrid um, academic model, if you will. Um, and then finally, uh, I'd like to end with this nice picture that I, I hope the fruit that you encounter look more like this than some of the samples that I showed you today. And uh, with that, I'd like to end my presentation and uh, take any questions you have. Hope, hope you guys enjoyed it.